Hi, I'm Pastor Mark Finley, and for the last 50 years I've traveled the world sharing the truths of the Word of God with tens of thousands of people. I've spoken in over a hundred countries and written more than 70 books. And today, I want to share with you seven facts that you don't know about Seventh-day Adventists. Now, when you study about what a religious faith believes, it's always wise not to go to what others say about them, to, but to go to what they say about themselves. For example, if I want to learn something about Hinduism or Islam or the Baptists or the Presbyterians or the Catholics or any Christian faith, it's only fair to go to the original source and find out what they believe. So we're not going to pull myths out of the air about Seventh-day Adventists. Recently, a book was written called Seventh-day Adventists Believe. And what we're going to do is look at the teachings of Adventists as outlined in this book and as I compare them to the Word of God. Many people will be surprised to know that Seventh-day Adventists are Bible-believing Christians. In fact, Seventh-day Adventists, this is fact number one, believe the Bible is the only source of faith and practice. They believe that the Bible is authoritative. They base that on 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible teaches that Scripture is the very foundation of our faith. Seventh-day Adventists believe that. The Bible also asserts that it's inspired by God, divinely inspired. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, the Bible puts it this way. It says, knowing this first, that no prophecy is of private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is the living Word of God, and as these prophets spoke, they revealed God's will to humanity. Seventh-day Adventists believe that. They don't have an extra biblical source contrary to some, what some teach, that supersedes the Bible. Seventh-day Adventists believe in the Bible and the Bible only as their source of faith and practice. This leads us to the surprising fact number two. Seventh-day Adventists believe that there are three co-eternal, co-equal persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's based, of course, on Scripture itself. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, the Bible talks about the plurality of the Godhead. In other words, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, the Bible puts it this way. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Now, that's a very fascinating passage. The word for Lord there is Jehovah. So it says, Jehovah, our God, the word for God is Elohim, which is the plural form of God. And then it says, the Lord is one. The word one there is Echad. Now, I want you to get this. The word Echad is not like the number one, number two, number three. That's a different Hebrew word. The word Echad has to do with the fusion of equals. So evening and morning were the first day two elements of time, and you have the first or one day, Echad day. For example, when a husband and wife are married, they become one, Echad, the two become one. They're two separate, distinct beings, but there's a oneness of mind, a oneness of heart, a oneness of purpose. So the Bible says, the Lord, Jehovah, our God, plural, is one, that is Echad, Jehovah. In other words, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three distinct beings that have the same purpose. They have the same desire. They, they follow the same plans. They have different roles in the Godhead, but they are united in the salvation and the joy and the happiness 
of the human race and of course the entire universe. Now, when you come to the New Testament, there are repeated references to the Godhead. The Bible does not use the term Trinity and many people are confused if you try to use that word, they have mistaken understandings of it. But let me look, for example, at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. This helps us to understand a little bit about the Godhead. Many people are surprised when they learn this startling fact about Seventh-day Adventists, that they are Bible-believing Christians who are committed to the authority of God's Word, that they believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They believe in the eternal nature of the Godhead. Here's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So here in this one passage, you have the Lord Jesus Christ, you have God, and you have the Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus' baptism. Jesus is being baptized. And as Christ is being baptized, a voice comes from heaven, from the Father, that says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And there at that very moment as well, the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus. So you have Jesus, you have the Father speaking from heaven, and you have the Holy Spirit coming upon him. The Bible says the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. You'll find that in Matthew chapter 3. You have the same thing at creation. God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus was the master architect, designer, as God worked through his Son as really the active agent in creation. The Bible says in Ephesians 3 verse 9 that, that Christ created the heavens and the earth, but in Genesis 1, 1 it says that God created the heavens and the earth. How do you harmonize that? God is this overall architect. God is the master designer, but he works through Jesus as the active agent in creation. Christ accomplishes that through the Holy Spirit. So who created the world? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as a unity created the world with this common purpose. What do Seventh-day Adventists believe? They believe, first, the Bible is God's Word, the foundation of faith. Secondly, they believe in the eternity of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal. Thirdly, now this is going to really shock you, Seventh-day Adventists do not believe in salvation by works. They do not believe that they are saved by what they eat or what day they keep or the external works they perform. Seventh-day Adventists are solidly committed to the Bible teaching of righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. They are solidly committed to the fact that we are saved by grace and grace alone. Now you find that in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Adventists do not believe that the works that we do save us. This is Ephesians chapter 2. There are many of the critics of Seventh-day Adventists that say that Seventh-day Adventists are legalists. We're going to get to that shortly. Ephesians chapter 2, but let me be very clear, very plain. Ephesians 2 verse 8. And it says this, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand for those that walk in him. Seventh-day Adventists believe that we can come to Jesus, that the only thing that saves us is the death of Christ on the cross, that we are saved by his grace, our faith. We're not saved by faith. Faith is the hand that takes hold of the grace that saves us. What is grace? Grace is God's mercy. Grace is God's pardon. Grace is God's goodness. Grace is who God is. He reaches out to us in our weakness, our folly, our sinfulness. And he says, my child, I hung on the cross for you. The nails through my hands were for you. The blood that ran down my temples were for you. You can come. You can come and find forgiveness and mercy. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, Leviticus 17, 11, without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Why? Why does Scripture say that? 
because the blood represents the life. And on the cross of Calvary, Christ's life was poured out for you. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were separated from God, disobeyed God. Guilt filled their souls. Separated from God, they were separated from the source of life. Jesus came to live the life that they should have lived. Jesus was the second Adam, according to Romans chapter 5. Jesus is the second Adam. He comes and covers the ground that Adam should have covered. He redeems our failures. His perfect life in the final judgment stands in the place of our imperfect life. The Bible says in Acts 4 verse 12, there is no other name under heaven whereby we might be saved except the name of Jesus. So Seventh-day Adventists do not believe in salvation by works. They believe in salvation by grace and grace alone. But wait, friend, what did our text say? Our text says, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 9. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Grace leads us to obedience, not to disobedience. In fact, in Romans 1, that's what Paul says. He says, I've given you the grace for obedience. So the grace of God pardons us from our past guilt, but also is operative as a living, dynamic principle in our lives through the Holy Spirit to change us, to make us over again. So we are created for good works. Seventh-day Adventists believe that faith leads you to have a relationship with Christ that changes your behavior. Seventh-day Adventists believe that grace not only pardons our past and delivers us from the guilt of sin, but it delivers us from the grip of sin. We are no longer under sin's condemnation. Romans 8.1, there is no longer no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But neither are we under sin's bondage, Romans 8, verse 15 and onward. So grace delivers us from the condemnation of the law, but it also delivers us from the bondage and the tyranny and the chains of sin. Grace leads us to obedience. This is why Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now here's one of the biggest misunderstandings. Many evangelical Christians particularly say, Seventh-day Adventists believe you're saved by law. Not so. Adventists believe you're saved by grace. But we believe that grace is so good that it enters our lives and leads us to live godly, obedient lives. Now, when you talk about the commandments, people always say, well, we're not saved by the law, and therefore we're under the new covenant. What is the new covenant? What does it mean to be under the new covenant? In Hebrews, the 10th chapter, in the 16th verse, it says, This is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. What is the new covenant? The new covenant is Jesus Christ who died for us, entering into our lives through the Holy Spirit, writing his law in our mind so we know it, and writing his law in our heart so we love it. That's what the new covenant is all about. When people say to me, well, you're not under law, you're under grace, what does it mean to be under law? It means to be under the condemnation of the law. It means that the law that you have broken condemns you. It means to be under the system of law as a method of salvation. We're not under the system of law as a method of salvation. We're under the grace of God as a method of salvation. But you know, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3 puts it this way. Paul says in Romans the third chapter, verse 31, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So Paul says, look, I'm coming to my conclusion. Whatever conclusion you come to that's not Paul's conclusion is indeed a wrong conclusion. Paul says, here, do you make void the law through faith? Not at all. We what? Establish the law. So when Seventh-day Adventists pray to God to live an obedient life, they're not trying to be obedient in their own strength. 
They're trusting the Holy Spirit to write the law in their minds so they'll know it in their hearts so they'll love it. But then somebody said, but, but you Adventists keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is Old Testament. It's, it's Judaism. Wait a minute. Let's think this one through. That's the fourth startling fact about Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists don't accept the Sabbath as an Old Testament legalistic requirement as a reversion to Judaism. Seventh-day Adventists want to go back much further than Judaism. They want to go back to the book of Genesis. And there in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible puts it this way. Genesis, the second chapter, verses 1 to 3. The Bible talks about the creation of our world. Now, remember, there is no Jew around at creation. When did the Jewish race come into existence? In the days of Abraham. And that was certainly over 2,200 years after creation. Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons, and those 12 sons became the tribes of Israel. So there were no Jews around at the time of creation. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis 2. Thus the, seven, thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which he had created and made. So there, at creation, God creates the seventh day Sabbath. He rests on the Sabbath. We rest because he rested. He blessed the Sabbath. You can get a blessing any day you worship on. But Seventh-day Adventists believe, based on Genesis 2, that God put a special blessing within the Sabbath. And as we come every Sabbath, we long for that blessing. God sanctified the Sabbath. The Bible says he set it apart, just like one woman set apart in marriage for one man. We worship God every day of our lives. We live lives of worship. But one day is especially sanctified. One day is especially set apart. That's why in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, the Bible puts it this way. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It says remember. Why did God say remember? Because he knew we would forget. Notice he doesn't say remember the Sabbath because in six days God created the heavens and the earth and the Sabbath is the Sabbath of the Jew. He says in the commandments it's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Somebody said, but the, the commandments were nailed to the cross. May I ask you a question? Which commandments were nailed to the cross? Was the one that says, thou shalt not have any other gods before thee? Was the one that says, thou shalt not make any graven image? When the one that was the one that says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain? Was the one that said, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother? With, with, which one? You say, oh, but wait a minute. We, 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 as Christians, we're motivated to keep, by the Holy Spirit, nine, but, but we'll leave the tenth, the Sabbath, nailed to the cross. Does that make any sense? Does God say, I'll write my law in your mind, and I'll write it in your heart, except for the fourth commandment, the Sabbath? You see, the Sabbath identifies the validity of the entire law of God. Because you read, thou shalt not have any other gods before thee, don't worship images. Why shouldn't I do that? Thou shalt not kill. Why shouldn't I do that? Thou shalt not steal. Why shouldn't I do that? But when you read the fourth commandment, which is the seal of the whole law, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days the Lord God created heaven and earth. The reason the law has validity is because we are creatures and he is creator. The reason the law has validity is because we did not evolve, but because God made us, God created us, God fashioned us. So the law has validity because we serve a creator God who's given us principles of living and the law reveals how to love. If you could summarize the whole law in one word, it's love. If you summarize it in two phrases, it's love God and love your fellow man. But the way we love God is by keeping the first four commandments. The way we reveal love to man is understanding the last six commandments. And so love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is not the breaking of the law. Like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, when he said, don't think I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I've come not to destroy, but to do what? Fulfill. 
Somebody says, is there any evidence at all in the New Testament about the Sabbath? Well, Luke 4, verse 16 says that as his custom was, Jesus kept the Sabbath. In Matthew chapter 24, he said, pray that when you have to flee from Jerusalem when the Romans are coming, that you don't have to do it on the Sabbath. Jerusalem was destroyed 70 AD, years, almost uh, 37 years after the death of Christ or thereabouts. And yet, he said to his followers, pray that your flight's not on the Sabbath. Why would he say that if they weren't keeping the Sabbath? But you know, in Acts, the 13th chapter, here, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul gets a whole city together. And as he brings that city together, they worship on the Sabbath. And in verse 42, it says, when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now notice what it says after that. The, to, what does Paul say? Does he say to the Gentiles, you come back tomorrow? Not at all. Notice it says the next Sabbath, the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Why didn't Paul tell them, hey, you come back on the first day of the week? You see, the Sabbath is of eternal significance. The book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. The Bible is the basis of our faith alone. It provides the foundation. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have worked together in creation. They work together to initiate the plan of salvation. Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross as our only Savior. We're saved totally by grace, but that grace leads us to obedience. It leads us to obedience to all God's commandments. And we keep the Sabbath not as a symbol of legalism, but we keep the Sabbath in acknowledgement that He is our Creator and we are His creatures. The Sabbath is a symbol of righteousness by faith, not righteousness by works, because on Sabbath we rest. We rest in His love. We rest in His care. We rest in His goodness. We rest in His salvation. And we rest looking forward to the new creation. Here is the next startling fact about Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists, fact five, believe in hope. They are a people of hope. They believe in Jesus' promise that he's coming again. John 14, verse 1 to 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus said, I will come again. Seventh-day Adventists are people of hope. Around us, we have crime. Around us, we have corruption. Around us, we have poverty and pollution. Around us, we have disaster and disease. Around us, all over the world, we see this groaning for deliverance. Seventh-day Adventists are a people of hope. They believe that the signs of the times reveal that Jesus is coming soon. Revelation 1 verse 7, he comes with clouds and every eye will see him. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 and 17, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the trump of God, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive shall be caught up to meet them, with them together to meet the Lord in the air. You see, Adventists are a people of hope. Their hearts beat with hope. They recognize that this world is not going to be destroyed in some thermonuclear disaster. That this world is not going to be destroyed by some cataclysm in the future. Adventists are a people of hope. They believe in the second coming of Christ. Here's the sixth fact that you didn't know about Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists do not believe they can eat their way into heaven. They don't believe they can exercise their way into heaven. They don't believe that the physical habits of life are salvic, that earn them salvation. But yet, Seventh-day Adventists are living between seven and ten years longer than their American neighbors. Why? Because they believe that their bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. You see, Adventists do not practice health because they think if they do, in some magical way, that will earn them salvation. But Adventists re recognize that human beings are holistic. 
They recognize that their bodies are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have from God and you're not your own? You're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Seventh-day Adventists believe that God has created them. Seventh-day Adventists believe that Jesus Christ has redeemed them. So we are twice His. We're His by creation and His by redemption. And as the result of that, Seventh-day Adventists believe that we ought to care for our bodies. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as we live in harmony with the principles of God's law as outlined in Scripture, it improves the quality of our life. In a stressful world, as we rest each Sabbath and have a peaceful mind, our health is improved. In a world of junk foods with fast foods, as we eat the plant-based diet that uh, God outlined in the book of Genesis of fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables, we reduce heart attacks, we reduce the amount of cancer, and we can reverse some of the degenerative diseases of our time. Now somebody says, but, but wait a minute, the Bible does not advocate a vegetarian diet. All Seventh-day Adventists are not vegetarians. A percentage of them are. S vegetarianism is not a tenet of the Seventh-day Adventist faith in the sense that it is a doctrine of the Adventist faith. Adventists recognize that the ideal diet given in the book of Genesis is a plant-based diet. They also recognize that throughout the Bible, after the days of Noah, God gave permission to eat meat. Adventists believe that a plant-based diet is the best diet, but they do not condemn people who are eating meat and who have not made a transition to that better diet yet. Adventists encourage the most healthful diet possible. They encourage the eating of foods in as natural states, less artificial as possible. But none of these things are tenets of faith. None of these things are doctrines. They are rather principles that God has given to enable us to live longer, happier lives. Adventists advocate a non-smoking lifestyle. Speak openly against any physical habit that destroys our body. Seventh-day Adventists recognize the physical and social dangers of excessive alcohol or alcohol at all and urge a temperate lifestyle. So Seventh-day Adventists want to be a healthy people. Seventh-day Adventists want to make a contribution to their society. That's why there are Adventist hospitals throughout. That's why there are Adventist health clinics. That's why Adventist churches conduct depression recovery seminars and re -seminar seminars on reversing diabetes and natural lifestyle cooking schools and uh, stress management programs. We want to make a contribution to our society and we believe that it honors God if we live a healthy lifestyle. Now here's the seventh fact that you likely don't know about Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists see the Bible in its broadest perspective. We recognize that there is a conflict between good and evil in the universe. Revelation chapter 12, and we're looking there at Revelation chapter 12, and we're looking starting with verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Isn't that a strange place for war? Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought in his angels. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. In the ancient realms of space, thousands of years ago, there was an intergalactic conflict, a great controversy, a cosmic battle between the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit on one side, and Satan and his angels on the other side. Satan had claimed that God was unfair and unjust. Satan had misrepresented the character of God. 
And as the result of that, said that God was authoritarian, that God was a vindictive judge and a wrathful tyrant. Why didn't God destroy Satan immediately? Because if God would have done that, the whole universe would have served him from fear. Satan. Did God create Satan? Not at all. He created a beautiful angel called Lucifer, coming from two words, Latin words, lux pharaoh. Lux is light, pharaoh is bearer. And so Lucifer rebelled against God. He wanted to take God's throne. He wanted to usurp God's authority, according to Isaiah chapter 14. Lucifer is cast out of heaven with his evil angels. But to be fair to the universe, he was cast out just as the earth was being created. God gave earth beings that power of choice. God gave earth beings, Adam and Eve, the power of choice. Who will they serve? Satan comes to Eve in the Garden of Eden and says, if you eat this fruit, God knows you will be an exalted being. You'll know good and evil. If you eat this fruit, you'll have a greater sphere of happiness and joy and meaning. God doesn't want you to enter into the fullness of life. He doesn't want you to have this kind of joy. Satan misrepresents the character of God. Eve partakes of the fruit. Adam partakes of it. Immediately they begin to die in their bodies. Their bodies are decaying. The wages of sin are death. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. God comes to that garden. He promises, Genesis 3.15, that the Messiah will come. Why did Christ come? For two reasons. To live for us and to die for us. He came to answer the charges of Satan. He came to clear the name of the Father. That's why he said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John 14, verse 9. Because every time Jesus touched blind eyes and they're opened. Every time he touched deaf ears and they were unstopped. Every time he touched a withered man's arm and it was healed. Every time he held a baby that had died and breathed life into it. He's saying, this is what God is like. God wants you to be healthy. God wants you to be well. See, the great controversy theme is unique. Seventh-day Adventists understand this controversy between good and evil. Christ came to reveal the Father. And he came to pay the ransom price for sin. He came to die the death we ought to die. He bore our sin and guilt and shame on the cross. Now every human being on planet Earth has the opportunity of accepting this gospel. And when this gospel, the kingdom, Matthew 24, verse 14, shall go to all the world, then the end shall come. And before the coming of Jesus, there will be a cosmic judgment, according to Daniel chapter 7. The books are open. The judgment is set. And the whole universe sees that God has done everything he could to save every human being. And that when the universe is satisfied, that every human being has had the final opportunity and choice to serve Christ, but those who've disobeyed have rebelled against the moving of his spirit. They've turned their backs on his love. When every human being has had the chance to see that, when Revelation 22, verse 11 and 12 is fulfilled, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And he that is unrighteous, let him be unrighteous still. And he that is unholy, let him be unholy still. Behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me. When every human being on earth has had a reasonable opportunity to make their final irrevocable decision, Jesus will come. He will come as King of Kings. He will come as Lord of Lords. Seventh day Adventists are a people of hope because they believe that in the final analysis, Jesus wins and Satan loses. They believe that Jesus will be triumphant. They believe that the powers of evil will be crushed and gone. The Bible says that God will create a new heavens and a new earth. Christ comes. We ascend to heaven with him. And then, after that great millennial period that the Bible talks about in Revelation 20, the holy city descends. And as it descends, the wicked, who now have been resurrected after they have been destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming, rush up to that city. They try to take it, but yet fire comes down from that city and devours them, and out of the ashes of the old world, God creates a new heaven and a new earth. Seventh-day Adventists believe in what the Bible teaches, that Jesus is going to come, that Jesus' plan will be triumphant, that his purpose will be triumphant, that his 
kingdom will reign forever and ever and ever and ever. Now this video may have stimulated some questions on your part. I've not answered all the questions and I've not certainly go in, gone into every doctrine that Seventh-day Adventists teach. Let me open my heart to you. I was a young 17-year-old boy seeking for truth, seeking for meaning in my life. And I began to study God's Word. I was not interested in man's opinion. I wanted to know what the Bible teaches. And as I studied, the Holy Spirit impressed me with the truths that I've shared with you. Now the truths that I've shared with you from the Bible today are not simply the only things that Seventh-day Adventists teach. And if you are really a truth seeker, I'd really love to be able to answer some of the questions you have or have our staff answer some of those questions. Now look, let me be honest with you. If you just want to debate, we're not interested in debating. You know, Jesus said in John 7, verse 17, if any man will do his will, then he shall know of the doctrine. See, understanding with our head first comes with a commitment of our heart. And if you really want to know God's will, if you are a truth seeker, if you really are anxious to know truth, I'm more than happy to share with you personally or have my staff share with you. If you have questions, we'd love to answer your questions. All you need to do is go to hopelives365.com forward slash questions. That's hopelives365.com forward slash questions. We are here for you. We're here to help you on that faith journey. There's no coercion, no pressure. You know, in my own faith journey as I sought, I was looking for truth. And when I found the real facts about Seventh-day Adventist, it resonated with what the Holy Spirit was doing in my own heart. It resonated with what the truths that I had discovered in the Word of God or in the Bible. We'd love to stay in touch with you. And if you like the video, click the subscribe button below. And I'd love to hear your comments on which of these seven facts were most inspiring to you or which one were most startling. Just let me know which ones were most surprising to you as well. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share God's Word with you. I know that there's somebody that's watching this video on YouTube that you are a truth seeker, that deep in your heart you want to know God's will for your life. Deep in your heart you desire to follow truth. I want to pray for you right now. Father in heaven, Thank you so much for the joy and opportunity of knowing your word. Thank you for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I pray for each one watching this YouTube video today. May the Holy Spirit guide them to understand your will and your ways and your truth. In Christ's name, amen.